Hello, I'm uh, Ian Todd from BBC Sky Night magazine, uh, and I'm here at the uh, Blue Dot Festival 2022 at Jodrell Bank Observatory in Cheshire. Um, and today I'm speaking to Dr. Sarah Crowther, who is uh, a planetary scientist and a space rocks expert at the University of Manchester. Uh, and she's been giving a, a talk today on um, asteroids and, and space rocks. Uh, Sarah, thanks very much for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me. Um, are you enjoying the festival so far? Like, do you like, do you sort of get a chance to to mingle and, and experience the the fun of the festival? Yeah, we do. So, as you said, I gave a talk earlier this morning, and our group also has a stall in the the science area. I think it's called Space Camp this year, where we've got meteorites, moon rocks for people to look at. But we we've got a, a reasonably big team, so we can take shifts on and off the stall. And when we're not on the stall, we can explore the rest of the festival. And it's really good. That that's cool. Like, 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 do you actually get to see bands and see other, see other your fellow scientists talk and things like that? Yeah, I haven't actually seen any other talks. And to be honest, last night I did go home before Groove Armada were on because I was tired. But I, I'll probably stay tonight and hopefully tomorrow to see uh, Bjork. Oh yeah, awesome, cool. Um, well, your, I mean, your talk today was on on asteroids. Um, so, what well, sort of space rocks? But I suppose asteroids um, was, was, was the main focus. Um, yeah. I, I did think it was worth maybe just kicking off our interview today with... Um, w most people would have heard of asteroids and the asteroid belt. What, what actually are asteroids? How do you, how do you sort of classi classify them? And so ast asteroids are, are rocks, um, as you said, most of them in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. You can kind of think of them as the leftovers from when the solar system formed. They, they range in size from almost a thousand kilometers in diameter for the largest up to a few, few meters perhaps for the smallest asteroids. There is actually enough material there to make a planet, but it never, I say it never got its act together. It never all coalesced into one single object to form a planet. So we can see in the asteroids, we can actually see the different stages of evolution in the solar system. Some of them, much like happened on Earth early in the solar system's history, some of them were big enough that they got hot and melted, formed a metal core and a rocky outer surface, whereas others never got hot enough to melt. They've barely changed since the solar system first formed four and a half billion years ago. And you can actually see in some of them like the very first solid materials that formed in our solar system. Whereas the record from when the solar system first formed has actually been overwritten here on Earth because we've got earthquakes, volcanoes, weather, and all sorts overwriting it. Um, so, uh, would you like our asteroids? Then are they per perfectly pristine samples from that from that era, from that early era? Yeah, some of them are. Some of them have like, they've barely been changed, barely changed for four and a half billion years. Others, as I said, have melted. So they're all mixed up, but some of them are very pristine. They, they retain that signature from when the solar system first formed. So what can we actually learn when we're, when we're studying asteroids? So we, we can learn a lot from them. We can look at their chemical composition. We can, so, you know, they can tell us what was the starting material for forming bodies like the Earth or other planets like Mars. So, you know, what, what was the starting material for forming Earth? How has it changed from that material to Earth or to, to planets like Mars we see today? So we can, we, we can learn an awful lot from them. And how, how do we actually do that? How do, how do we actually study something that's so far away? So t we can study asteroids through meteorites. Meteorites are any rock that has come from space to Earth. We have about 70,000 meteorites. The vast majority of them come from the asteroid belt. There's a handful from the moon and a handful from Mars, but the vast majority of that 70,000 are from the asteroid belt. And they're from all those different types I talked about, the melted ones or the ones that haven't changed. We can also look at asteroids from Earth, look at how they reflect or absorb light, which can tell us information about them. And there have actually been a couple of space missions that have gone to asteroids, collected material, and brought it back to Earth, which was the focus of the talk this morning. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in that notion of being able to study meteorites um, on Earth, and that can tell us a lot about what's going on out there. Is, are, are there particular places that you would go typically to look for meteorites? Or are, typical, are certain places on Earth better than others to, to try and find them? Yeah, so a meteorite could land anywhere. Um, roughly equal chance of it landing anywhere on Earth. But they're often just black-looking rocks. So somewhere like here, they're 
they would be really hard to find because, you know, particularly if one landed in the main arena last night, which is probably full of mud by now, you'd just never spot it in there. But there are some places where a black rock stands out against the natural environment. It's something that's not supposed to be there. So people go looking for them in places like Antarctica, the Sahara Desert, um, the Atacama Desert in Chile. And it, it's not that they're more likely to fall there, but that they're easier to spot there. And we also have cameras across the country watching the sky all the time. And in fact, I know one was installed here at Jodrell Bank just last week. So these cameras are watching the sky all the time. Um, they'll capture photographs of any shooting stars. And if several cameras across the country capture a shooting star, then people can work out the trajectory. Um, they can actually even work out, was there enough material originally that something will have landed on Earth or will it all have got burnt up in the atmosphere? And you may remember back in February of last year, um, a meteorite was found in a village called Winchcombe in Gloucestershire, and that was caught on these, these cameras. And as I said, the people did the calculations and said it's probably landed in this area. And it had, it was right where it was predicted, which was amazing. Yeah, I think I, I remember that story. Didn't it turn up on a family's driveway? Yeah, that's exactly right. So as I said, the cameras saw it. Um, the calculations suggested there was probably something. So I, I gather this family, they call the Wilcox family, live in the village called Winchcombe. I gather they heard something in the evening, because it happened about 10 o'clock at night, and I think they thought a picture had fallen down or something. <laughs> um, but the next morning, I think their son saw it on the news, and they opened the front door, and there was this pile of what might have looked like charcoal, the remnants of a barbecue, on the front drive. But because the, I think it was the son had heard this in the news... Um, they knew not to touch it with their bare hands, not because it's dangerous to us, but because we don't want to contaminate it with all the grease and muck that's on our hands. But to um, pick it up, I don't know if they use foil or anything like a sandwich bag, and they got straight in touch with the researchers at the Natural History Museum who dispatched someone out to have a look, and that was recovered within about 12 hours of it landing, which is amazing. That's awesome. D does does the, the speed with which it was found... Does does that help scientists like yourself? It, it does, because it means it was minimally exposed to our weather. And by some miracle for the UK, it hadn't rained that night. <laughs> so it hadn't got rained on or anything. It had just sat there for 12 hours. Um, you know, some of the meteorites we find could have been sitting in Antarctic ice for thousands of years. Now, they're, they're still really useful, still really interesting, but they have been affected by the water and the, the weather. So to find it so fresh is really important. That's amazing. I mean, I suppose that brings us on nicely to the other thing I wanted to ask you about, because I suppose there's no more pristine sample of a that, that we can get hold of than actually visiting an asteroid. Yeah. Um, but because as, because as, I, I suppose that that might be an argument that people people would make. You know, why would you spend so much money on visiting asteroids when you can get them on Earth? Yeah, we can get them on f for free on Earth when they come as meteorites, but we don't know exactly where they came from. So. First of all, well, there's, there's a, the issue of them sitting here in the weather. Meteorites, as I said, some fall and we find them really quickly. Others have sat here for thousands of years, potentially, being affected by the weather, and that can alter them somewhat. And we also, we don't know exactly where the meteorites come from. We know what type of asteroid they, we think they came from, but we don't know exactly which asteroid. But if we go there and pick it up and bring it back, not only do we know exactly which asteroid it's come from, but we can study that asteroid while it's there so we can learn about um, the asteroid and the geological context that this sample came from, which gives us a huge amount more information. Um, so, yeah, so do the... Um, so the discovery of meteorites on Earth and sample collect missions to asteroids, they sort of complement each other? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because then we'll be able to say, so we can get material from a particular asteroid say oh we know where that's come from and then we can compare the meteorites we have and see how they've changed or which are the same which are slightly different so okay this we know this material came from this asteroid that meteorite's actually slightly different so maybe it came from from a different one and, and we can learn lots about them definitely complementary as you said it's still it still seems like it's very very early days for these sample co collect missions there's only really a, a handful of them isn't there there is. There's, obviously, everyone knows about the Apollo missions that um, went to the moon and brought back the Apollo samples. People are still su studying those 50-plus years later. Since the Apollo missions, there was um, 
anatomician called Genesis that collected the solar winds, that's the hot plasma that comes off the sun. There was an anatomician called Stardust that flew through the coma of a comet, collecting material from there. There's a um, Japanese Hayabusa mission, which was the first one to land on an asteroid, but its sampling mechanism didn't work. It got a tiny bit of material, but not as much as they were hoping for. So then they followed that up with Hayabusa 2, which came back December 2020. And, you know, so people are working really hard on those samples now. And there's a, a NASA mission called Osiris Rex, which has visited another asteroid, and that's due back on Earth in September of next year. I think that's everything. I don't think I've missed any. <laughs> I might have done, but I think that's everything. <laughs> now, you've actually worked on, on sampling um, uh, uh, the uh, material that's been brought back from some of these missions, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I was just doing uh, Hayabusa 2 samples quite recently. So, what? well, actually, I suppose that the first question is, how, how big a sample do you get? So it depends. Um, the Hayabusa 2 mission, the total mass it collected was about 5 grams. So we were part of what was called the initial analysis phase, which was um, the first phase of analysis where there were six teams of scientists from across the world who got the, were the first to get the samples, but only about 3% of the material, so less than a gram. I think it was, it was about 0.6 of a gram, something like that, was allocated to these 300 samples. The sample we got to that was about 0.1 of a milligram. <laughs> right. It was tiny. <laughs> we were always worried about losing it, but we didn't. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> But, but you, you can obviously do good, really good science, even with something yeah, that, that, yeah, that, you that can, to normal. Yeah, even that small, small, you can... You can Because these instruments are so sensitive. You know, meteorites, you can have much more material, but you're always limited. It's not like studying rocks on Earth, where you can go out and get bucket loads, and if you need a bit more, you go and get another bucket load. We're always limited on material. So, you know, people have developed really, really sensitive analyses, really sensitive techniques and instruments, so that we can maximize the amount of information we can get from just a tiny bit. That's awesome. So whenever you, um, well, I suppose, how, how do you actually get your hands in a sample? Because there, there, there must be lot, you know, scientists around the world who would want to get their hands on a, a sample from a, a mission like uh, Hayabusa 2, you know, very high profile. Yeah, so the initial analysis teams are selected by the, the, the organization, whether that's JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency or NASA, who are running the mission, and that will be um, scientists with whose track record, they know they've got a good track record, they usually they can do something that's important and relevant to the mission, perhaps something that nobody else in the world can do, you know, because some, some instruments are unique worldwide. So those people get selected to be part of the mission. But then usually after that first analysis phase, the samples are made available for other researchers to apply for. So then you'd have to write a proposal, this is what I want to do, this is why I want to do it, this is why I should do it rather than anyone else. And those will be reviewed by other researchers and then they'll decide who to give material to or who, who do, unfortunately doesn't get it. It's, it sort of sounds similar to uh, an astronomer re requesting time in a telescope? Is yeah, I guess so. Same sort of yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of, it's day one, you've, you've got the sample and this is the day that you're going to start analysing it. What, what do you do? What, what instruments do you do or do you use and what are you looking for? So we use mass spectrometers, uh, which allow us to measure how much of different elements or isotopes there are. Isotopes are the different forms of the same element. Um, the instrument I use is called RELAX, which doesn't actually mean I'm just sitting in the lab with my feet up <laughs> all the time. It stands for Refrigerator Enhanced Laser Analyzer for Xenon. So this is um, a unique instrument and it just measures one element, Xenon. So if we think of the periodic table, the very right-hand column are the noble gases, things like helium and neon and argon, and Xenon is one of the heavier ones. So we just measure that and it's we can learn a lot from just one element. So xenon has nine of these different types, these different isotopes, and they can be produced by different physical processes like radioactive decay of different parent species. So by measuring all the different nine types of it, we can work back and figure out what's contributed. So, you know, we measure a mix of everything, but we can work back and, and see what's contributed to what we're measuring. That's incredible. Um, I mean, what, what sort of discoveries are, are, are made in, in missions like Hayabusa 2 or Hayabusa or sort of going, going back even further? Like, do, do we learn a lot from these, from these asteroid sample missions? 
Yeah, we do. So if we go if we go back to the first higher boost submission for a moment. Um, I said their sampling mechanism didn't work properly. They got less than a gram of material, and most of it was I forget exactly. Is it 0.1 millimeter across? I don't know. It was really small. But even from that, we can learn about the history of the asteroid it came from. So the asteroid it came from must have originally been much bigger than it was when it was sampled. And we're sort of talking 20 plus kilometers across, whereas now I think, I forget, I think it's a few hundred meters across. So at some point it has broken up. We can also, um, with Hayabusa, they discovered it had more water in than they expected. So perhaps that particular type of asteroid may have contributed quite a lot of water to Earth's oceans. That's cool. I mean, yeah, that's, that, that's one of the things you were sort of exploring in, in your talk earlier on today, is this notion that um, asteroids d d delivered much of Earth's water. Yeah, so we think that um, asteroids probably delivered a lot of Earth's water and a lot of the organic material, that's, both of which are key to life, to Earth. And the, the more recent missions, Hayabusa 2 and Osiris-Rex, have gone to, meteor gone to asteroids that we think match a type of meteorite we call carbonaceous chondrites. And they, they are quite rich in carbon material, so these are important to study because we do think it's that type of asteroid that delivered a lot of the organics for life to Earth. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, as we're, as we're recording, um, OSIRIS-REx is, is, still, is still yet, yet to return its sample to Earth. What are, you, yeah. what are you hoping from that mission? that it makes it back safely yeah. in the first place. Um, because if you, if you remember back Genesis mission, which was the one that collected solar wind, um, when that sample return capsule was coming through the atmosphere, its parachutes never opened. And so uh, it, it was supposed to slow down. In fact, they never wanted that to touch the ground. There were these crazy Hollywood stuntmen hanging out a helicopter with fishing rods, who after the parachutes had opened and it slowed, they were supposed to catch it. But the parachutes never opened and it, it hit the Earth uh. um, at terminal velocity. So my first hope is just that it makes it back safely. But then when we start analysing the samples, um, you know, who knows, we'll, could, we could find, who knows what we'll find, we just have to wait and see. Do you, do you um, and, and or your colleagues at the University of Manchester, have you, have you applied for, for samples to study from that mission? Yeah, again, we're part of the, one of the initial analysis teams, um, so we, we will be getting some of the first batch of samples. Would you like to see a, a, a UK space agency or, or an ESA mission, a, a, a sample collection mission? Yeah, of course, absolutely. The more samples we can collect, the more we understand. You know, we, I don't think we can have too many samples. Yeah, and there was another really interesting thing, point that you um, made during your talk today is that not, not all of the sample will be studied. Some of it's held for, for, for future generations, essentially. Yeah. Um, because technology and techniques will all develop. So if we go back to the Apollo missions, which were 50 plus years ago, only a small fraction of that material was analyzed at the time. And some of those samples were essentially put into storage. And some are just being opened now, 50 plus years later. Because an analogy I sometimes use before, if you think of a, a telephone in 1969, there was one in the house, it was attached to the wall, and you had to dial up the number. And now we all have our smartphone in our hand. We don't leave the house without it. They're even letting us use them here this weekend, whereas normally they're banned. So think of how much something like that has changed in 50 years. And, you know, our ability to do analyses of these samples has changed similarly over 50 years. So who knows where we'll be in, in another 50 years. So just a small fraction will be given out at the time, and then in the future, as techniques develop, people can do more things, or even just, you know, the computing power improves and allow them to get more information out of the data they record. Samples will be studied for many, many years to come. So do you think there's a, there's a potential that people born this year might do their PhD on, on OSIRIS-REx? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, that's a nice thought, that, What's that? It's only 20 years yeah, down the line. Yeah, probably. Absolutely. Cool. That's fantastic. Well, that's that's a nice thought to end on, and um, this prospect of future generations studying what what we're, what we're doing now, what we're yeah. what we're collecting now. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for uh, for speaking to me today. Thanks uh, for having me and uh, for uh, sharing your expertise. And you know, good luck with the high Vista two stuff, and, and good luck with Osiris Rex. And hope, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll uh, speak to you again when you're when you're looking at that sample yeah, material. I'd be very happy to. Thank you. Thank you.